this will be the 259th episode I've done. Wow, you're so impressive. My God. Now, hold on, hold on. It means you're just lucky number 259. <laughs> that means there's 258 people more important than I am. <laughs> exactly. So, I, you know, I scheduled it three years ago. I'm like, you know, Munafa was 2021, mid-May. <laughs> we'll make it happen. We, we make sure there's a blast before Beirut yeah. is devastated oh, this way. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, going straight to the morbid right away. You know, I, I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. And, and I'll be honest, I was a bit, uh, I was hesitant at first to reach out to you long ago when I started doing these episodes. Because I know just how busy you are, how active you are. And I've seen you on occasion, even on CNN. I think it was with Christiane Amanpour. After the yeah, a couple blast. of times. Yeah. Right. And I literally just watching you on the news. And I, I wasn't in Beirut when the blast happened. I was in New York. So I just flipping channels and then I see you. <sighs> of course, that's just one. I mean, that's one very tragic moment that I've sort of, I've seen your take, or I've listened to your take. Um, local politics, Beirut Medinati, um, all things urban planning. I mean, there's decades of material here. <laughs> so as somebody who's rather naive on these subjects, I was a bit, I was a bit shy to reach out to you. But then after interacting with you a bit on Twitter and sort of poking a bit here and there at banyan trees and sort of thinking, yeah, no, it's fine. Mm-hmm. I, can, I can do this now. Uh, I'm, I'm honored. I'm honored that you're willing to talk about things that are sensitive, but I think they, they've shaped our lives and it's the story of our time. This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatar. This is the Beirut Banyan. I think the last time I saw you was when you were very kind to me. Um, I was an amateur walking tour narrator. This may be 13 years ago, 12, 13, this is a long time ago. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing. But that was very nice. You know, it was I a very believe, fresh take on the city. <laughs> I, was, I was actually, uh, I was, I, I admired you already. You know what, I'm going to go earlier now, 2006, <laughs> just after the July war. Uh-huh. I, apl- I applied to the Master's in Urban Planning program. I got oh, in. that I don't remember. Okay. I got in. And then I also got into CAMES, the Middle East Studies program. And they said I could take courses in urban planning and apply it to Middle East studies. So I ended up in a way dancing to the tune mm-hmm. of both de- in a way, but I ended up with a Middle East studies degree. So I knew you already. Um, oh. I was in a relationship with an architecture student who spoke very highly of you. I'll say her name in case she's watching Maureen Abiranem, if that of sounds familiar. Of course, of course. She's a wonderful student. She's doing her PhD now uh, at Columbia in Ex- city planning. Exactly. So this is, we're dating ourselves now deliberately. This is going back in time. But you're, I always respected your take on at least you, when it comes to local issues and urban planning in particular. So when you showed up as a surprise guest with your husband for one of the rare <laughs> private tours that I was giving on occasion, I was a bit awestruck. And the reason I'm starting here is because I was trying in a way to share a story that you're so well versed in, in a slightly entertaining way that could be digestible to visitors. And I remember you said something and it stuck with me. I was trying to deliver Solidaire in a digestible way. And you're there. And I, it's like almost my heart was racing. <laughs> you turned to me, you said, I think that's a fair way of explaining what happened. I'm like, yes, 
I got the Munafuwa's badge of honor. I did it. I was diplomatic. That's so sweet. <laughs> You're making me so self-conscious. <laughs> no, but it, it stuck with me. And you know what? It was quite funny because I, I think just shortly after that, you said, well, I'm going to leave the tour early. I think I have better things to do. And you just walked away. I stayed with your husband in the small group. You may have had better so things to do. <laughs> I'm sure I had a lot of work to do or I would have never left it. I actually keep a very good memory of the tour, really. And uh, we still talk about it every now and then. So uh, it was a very, very pleasant tour. And it was full of stories, people's stories. And I think that's what makes a city. So that's why I thought it was so valuable. Yeah. I fortunately got better and better at it. And it's very nice to know that you were there at the beginning when I was still trying to figure it out. And knowing that you enjoyed it then really means a lot to me. I did it on and off for 15 years. So it became in a way a profession. Um, mm -hmm. But storytelling, you're absolutely right. I think that's the magic. And yeah. I, I've said this in different outlets. I've said it repeated, repeatedly. I think Beirut is the best story ever told. It just <laughs> depends how you tell it. It's shocking how bad things got in the last decade. And I think whether it's seeing you on TV or whether it's hearing you, watching you on the news or even, even online, I think uh, you're one of the more eloquent sort of voices. And I want to start really with now, what we're living through. This is your terrain, this is your turf. Political reform, economic dignity, urban planning, yet it's the worst, it's the ugliest versions of these things. And in May, 2021, do you have any, any hint of optimism in the years to come. And I'm keeping this very, very thin. I'm keeping it superficial deliberately. Do you think it's just a matter of time before things get better in this place? Or do you see it bleaker in a sense that we're perhaps at a point of collapse and failure and we have to readjust ourselves to what increasingly feels like almost permanent paralysis? Um, wow, that's a tough question to answer. Um, I have to say, I don't uh, like the uh, very optimistic, uh, hyper tone uh, that some uh, people are, have taken recently and saying, we will win, we will take over. Um, I feel we're in a very, very difficult moment. And I think the most difficult part is the fact that we really don't have a working theory of change. So we're in a situation where we're, I think, much better than uh, a couple of years ago because there is a lot of consensus among everyone I talk to that the way we've done things is uh, just unworkable. So while we spent a lot of energy uh, explaining to people why the economic model we adopted um, cannot uh, be viable on the long run, why um, the political system that we live in, whether it's sectarianism or even the mode in which we thought we could protect our country or build ourselves as a nation, all of these now have come to their logical conclusion. They're just unworkable. And uh, I like to say that I would want to stop critiquing uh, what people call the political class because it's useless. Right. I think if you pick the cockroach right there and you ask him what he thinks of, I don't know, Berre or any of the others, he would say, honestly, uh, I'm better than them. And he would be right. The, the cockroach would definitely be right. And I don't think anyone needs convincing anymore. So we're in the next phase where we still have to come up with a theory of change that's workable in which we think what is going to get us to the next step in which we can build a new collective, a new sense of we that we can build around, that we can share, that can help us uh, invent a better future. I honestly don't think we're alone in this. If you look at global politics, a lot of countries are actually uh, in this situation. The yeah. ideal model of the modern nation state uh, that was invented about a hundred years ago, and it's ironic, we're celebrating 100 years of Lebanon is not such a great success story for most people. Mm. So maybe, that's why as an urbanist, I would say what I find hope in is the fact that uh, 
the cities, their quarters, their neighborhoods provide a space in which people can concretely talk about how are we going to share that space? What's a good way of living in it? And so when I start thinking about the city, it gives me a nice uh, way of starting to think about a theory of change for Lebanon, for Beirut. And that's, if you want, where I get my hope, my drive, and uh, still an ability to engage despite the difficulty of the moment. You know, I like this phrase, theory of change, or even that potential question that what does that look like in the Lebanese context? And before going too far back in time, I remember reading a piece that you wrote for the New Century Foundation. And I believe this is, this could be just before October, 2019. So it's a, it's a it's almost a reflection on Beirut Medinity and its yeah. evolution. But I actually didn't notice until today when I was trying to find it and I found it, it's, it's almost like it could have been taking place now. Yeah. Even, and there's this phrase in there I mean, you, hit, you refer to it, kilon yani kilon, the chance emerging on the street, the questions posed, domestic politics, local politics versus national issues and geopolitics, they're all there. Now that's pre-2019. So before we go back in time, I'm curious, and I'm going to link up that, that article to the episode. Are those still the fundamental questions before we can get to that theory of change? And it's almost the, it's the cliche stuff, ignoring external issues, ignoring the sensitive issues, or perhaps putting them on the shelf and focusing in on very local, very important issues, and then trying to find that happy space in the middle where you can get <laughs> enough people to agree. And the reason I'm starting here is because that is also my, my memory of Beirut Medinati. Of course, pre-October 2019, it's honing mm -hmm. in on the city. I mean, the, the name is, it's, it's self-explicable, Beirut Medinati. It's not bigger than that. Yet, I think my sense is that those questions are the same ones that are still being asked in every single opposition camp, every single clubhouse debate, <laughs> every, every uh, topic whenever elections come up. It's, it's almost the same substance. So is this a repetitive thing? And, and is this the fundamental th question before getting into the theory of change? I do feel retrospectively that um, there was a place in which we deliberately wanted to duck. We wanted not to look, I wanted not to look at geopolitics. I wanted to pretend that they weren't there because if I start thinking about Iran and Saudi Arabia and US sanctions and Israel and uh, the war in Syria, it becomes very paralyzing. These are huge things. So when you remember that actually the guys who, uh, I don't know, I mean, just now from our today's reality, the guys who wired their money abroad were not right. given a green light by another country. They decided between each other. Uh, and so many other things that make our daily misery, including how many millions of dollars we've spent and we still are without a sewer system, proper water, proper electricity, things that could make our lives so much easier and allow us to actually have more time to discuss our differences as citizens. Well, that is not even there. And those are really very local issues. So I guess I tell myself, if I focus on these issues, if I can make a dent, a dent there, I can be part of an ecosystem where maybe other people will uh, have other inputs where other convergences will also happen. But I think I deliberately choose to focus on uh, where I think I can make a difference. Because otherwise, I can't find any more the energy to keep going. I'm, I'm not going to go do, uh, I don't know, geopolitical negotiations and convince the Iranians and the Saudis to talk to each other. I know they're influencing our everyday life, but they're if not I, alone. If I ever <laughs> see you on TV in that discussion, I'm like, wait, wait, I got this person completely wrong. What is she doing there? Come back. <laughs> no, but there, I know this is, I, I guess that is, it's such a complicated discussion to begin with, yet it mm -hmm. seems to engulf most debates. And I had a recent conversation with Jaber Dumit. I'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. you know. And yeah, of maybe his campaigning was deliberately more national. He wasn't a Beirut specific person. Yet his 
campaigning was in Beirut as somebody from Beirut and Ashrafi and I used to see him walking around Beirut and discussing politics actually called him out on it he was using a hashtag walk Beirut I was getting requests to walk around with Jalbert and I had to tell him Jalbert I think I, <laughs> something's wrong in the ecosystem I don't think you want them coming my way you should take them but but his his recent reflection was that it's impossible today to to make that case on his on his side uh, without addressing the more sensitive issues. And geopolitics, unfortunately, is in that sort of space. Do you see it that way as well? That that it's impossible. I'm not saying that it's principled or not. Rather than it's hard to campaign in an upcoming election while pushing those issues aside, at least at least right now, given the, given the heightened rhetoric and given how front and center that debate has become. So I'm curious if there's, is, is there a way to keep things local at this time? I mean, look, politi- what is politics? Ultimately, mm. politics is about being able to create a collective that can think together and form a body politic that can think of how it wants to be governed as a collectivity. Mm. For me, this is what politics is about. It's about being able to shape a we and think how do we govern ourselves, in what form, in what way. So that we has to be anchored in a place with people, with communities, with individuals. And uh, we have to start a conversation somewhere. Uh, if for some, to some people, uh, that conversation has to have the typical script we grew up thinking, you know, you put a microphone in front of someone's name and he starts saying, and then, you know, you, right. you get into a sequence of issues where you can't really get people to talk because it, they're so anchored in their position. And it's very difficult to create uh, a collectivity in that context. So that's mm. why I think starting with very concrete issues of how do you live your everyday life? How do you get to your water? Um, how do you think you want to walk down your street? Provides with a first conversation. And look, I mean, we experienced it in 2006 when we uh, went to Hart Hrek immediately after uh, the Israel war on Lebanon. And we were keen on saying Hart Tahrik is just another neighborhood of Beirut. And just like there was a big national conversation about Beirut downtown, we're going to have a big national conversation about Har Tahrik. And everyone in Beirut should be familiar with this neighborhood. This is not, Israel claims this is Hezbollah's territory and so no one can go there and it bombed it because it's Hezbollah's territory. We don't want to accept this. We're going to say everyone should be able to go there and this is a neighborhood of the city and everyone should care and go and help there. And um, I think that when we did that for at least a month and a half, there was a conversation between a UB student, colleagues in the city and residents in the neighborhoods, including developers who were sitting with and talking uh, to about everyday life. And when we started with what space do you imagine and how is reconstruction going to happen, we did not just talk about this. We talked about the significance of loss. We right. talked about who the war was against. And we managed to create a common ground. That was, of course, not what Hezbollah wanted, right? I mean, mm. so the first mm. thing they wanted is for us to go back home and to recreate that divide. And eventually, between the national government cursing the residents of Haithi and accusing them of illegality on the one hand, and Hezbollah convincing them it will rebuild, we were out. So it's not yeah. that we were so strong. But my point is, start the conversation somewhere. And I think that that's where I feel the, again, planning, the urban is about that collectivity and it gives you a very a good place to start. But you should not, if people start saying, other, talking about other issues of differences, just saying, oh, this doesn't matter. No, it matters. And it's part of a co- conversation about creating a collective. I don't you know, know if I'm making sense. But no, yeah. no, you, you are. And in a way you're offering what I've been, so this is really why I wanted to talk to you is because you you have that longer view. And you, just mm-hmm. by mentioning Hara Tahrik in, in 2006, of course, the story goes earlier. Um, it's not the first time people are trying to find a way to navigate Lebanon's geopolitical predicament and focus on local issues and not let those get thrown under the bus while Lebanon is dealing with other things. So I, I appreciate that 
it's not the first time people are focusing on domestic issues. It may be the loudest and most visible at this moment that there's a national outcry for domestic reform, but it's not the first time. And mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a quote in, the, in, that, in that piece and I found it, and I'm gonna take the liberty here in quoting you to you. <laughs> Beirut Medinadi campaign built on earlier campaigns that had been organized in Beirut since the end of the civil war. Chief among those were urban-based claims that have been the subject of substantial mobilization since 1991. Most notably, they included the resistance to the private company Solidaire's post-war redevelopment of the historical core of the city of Beirut, as well as heritage preservation campaigns, anti-highway movements, and campaigns for public space and rent control. That story, I automatically think of you. And I had the, I had the, the, the good fortune to speak to Muna Al-Halla um, several years back. She was one, on the first sort of string of episodes I did. And we talked about her student days, seeing Martyr Square bulldozed, the Barakat building, saving it on her terms, almost like an innocent story. And I sensed that at least in the early 1990s, despite how difficult things were coming out of a civil war, that there was real momentum at trying to find a way forward that would not sell the city center off to what it became, which is a very different urban city space, I think that many of us wanted to see. And it's, it's today, it is what it became. And I'm curious if that's where the mistakes begin. Meaning, and this, I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask, I'm, I'm talking too ahead. much. I'm no sorry worries. about that. No, no, at all. <laughs> I think it goes back to that moment we shared on the tour. And the question actually was surrounding Solidaire and whether or not the, the municipality in the early 1990s and its, and its shape then, not a sort of hypothetical one, would have done worse to downtown. I hope I'm asking it in a fair way as well. No, no, I, I fully, fully, fully agree. I mean, in 1990, I was 17. It was my first engagement with the thinking about politics and who we were. The absurdity of the war just one day ended and we didn't know why it ended. And uh, I uh, remember in the early 1990s uh, that I was, I joined uh, a movement called uh, Mwatin. I think it was, and we used to go uh, to around school and we would talk about the fact that we needed a tribunal of war. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we were very, very inspired by South Africa. I remember it was around the same time. And in South Africa, there was a truth and reconciliation committee. There was a notion of accountability and a recognition of the wrongs that happened. And right. in Lebanon, the warlords just went they forgave each other and they came back in Versace shoes, uh, suits, right? And they became <laughs> businessmen. And, uh, and that was the, 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 they became then states people, they're statesmen who are rebuilding the country and it was the exact same people. So there was something really absurd about that. And if uh, like me, you had lost friends in the war, you had lived your life ducking in, uh, I'm giving up, I'm giving in my age, but I mean, we spent years in the shelter. Our teenage years were really a lot of fear and uh, 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 and street wars. So yes, for us, uh, it was really absurd that they did that. And then came the story of Beirut downtown and the reconstruction of Beirut downtown. And it was all about erasure. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've written this actually. I think that uh, every time we've approached a post-disaster recovery in Lebanon, We've used the occasion to consolidate what the war did instead right. of yeah. recovering, creating yes. a new beginning. In 1990, Beirut downtown had become a, become a no man's land, right? It was the area where the militias uh, lived that they occupied. They had evicted people and life from it. You were not allowed to go. You didn't know it. Right. And what did we do with this, with the post-disaster recovery? We created a no man's land, a big parking space with a few areas where supposedly the high yield can go and do their shopping. In practice, it's today a military zone. Yeah. We can't use it. We can't, uh, we can't consider it our historic core. We have very, very few of us have even connections to this area of the city. Right. We did exactly the same thing in 2006. I'm sorry, I keep going back to it, but I feel there's such a glaring parallel. In 2006, Har Tahrik was not just Hezbollah's stronghold. Har Tahrik was a neighborhood that uh, 
uh, epitomized the urbanization of the rural population from South Lebanon. Also, that had come to Beirut, that managed to build an urbanity to find a space for itself. It was a place where residents had been displaced in the beginning of the civil war. It had a long history. It was a very dynamic place. It was the place some of us went shopping because it had cheaper German yes. goods. Right. It, it meant something, right? And yeah. then the, the Israeli army comes and says, this is Hezbollah's stronghold and in three, over three days completely destroys with air raid the neighborhood. And it says, I'm destroying Hezbollah's stronghold, their headquarters. And what do we do? How do we reconstruct it? Single-handedly by Hezbollah that sets up its own company and rebuilds it. And eventually, Hezbollah doesn't even need to have a flag in the area because it has 220 buildings it has rebuilt that tell the story of its glory over the neighborhood. So the post-war reconstruction, again, consolidates what the war has done. Instead of bringing back Harta Hrik to Beirut, it again says Harta Hrik is the part of Dahye that, that where no one dares to go. And today we, we're, we, we have to ask ourselves this question. Are we going to keep doing this, allowing every post-disaster recovery to consolidate what the disaster has done and the circumstances that have led to, uh, to the disaster? What led to the disaster was the callousness of our political class. What led to the disaster is what? It's the fact that people were leaving the neighborhoods. They could no longer live there, even already before the explosion. Right. Are we going to rebuild them in a way that's gentrified, that doesn't protect the history of the areas, and that consequently we end up consolidating a third time the loss of Beirut as a shared place where people live together? Uh, it, I think it's critical. That's why it's also the right place to start if we are trying to build the collective. No, but this parallel, which I think of often, I'm glad you're actually, you're mentioning it, that there's a repetition. Clearly, Solidaire and Hara Tehrik and what happened post-Civil War in downtown and in Hara Tehrik is not the same exact story, clearly, but, but the parallels are obvious and that there's constraints, that there's this domestic desire, or at least appears to be a, will, a, a real desire to be involved. And I vague, I mean, I'm a little, I'm a bit younger, but I vaguely, vaguely remember that discussion in the early 1990s of these community sort of community engagement attempts with Solidaire that went perhaps one step forward, but did not clearly deliver what people wanted. And at the end of the day, Solidaire becomes a fait accompli. And politics is part of that story. Same thing with Dahi, same thing with 2006, that you even could have the same person showing up to these occasions trying, but faced with that, that wall. And going back to this theory of change, which, which you eloquently presented at the beginning, is there a stumbling block to reform in this country? And I'm asking this in a, an almost a, a silly way. Is it that we say the civil war ended, but perhaps the civil war, the fighting stopped, but the components that were there during the civil war persisted. And we're still dealing with a civil war like state without, without gunshots, without snipers, even when they do reappear from time to time, but that it's not a functioning state the way we could have held to account had there been something more maybe more structured in a post-civil war environment. And, and I'll posit this even one step further that Ashrafi or Jamezi, Madam Khayel, Karantina, these neighborhoods today, they're in the same predicament really, that you could have people trying, sometimes success stories at heritage homes that are not torn down or this Butros uh, Highway, I forget the exact name. I think it's the Butros Highway. That's supposed Pod to- Butros Highway. Pod yeah. Butros Highway from Sesin to Madam Khair, which did not happen. But that's not really the story. The story is that you still have that wall to reform. Look, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I, I don't have an answer. I, I, I would just say that in 1990, people were exhausted. So when we tried to mm -hmm. say holding uh, people accountable, um, a lot of the reaction was, we can't just believe it's behind us, you know, let right. us move forward. And I think uh, people were just, uh, and I remember my own parents who always 
brought us up, we had no idea what our religion was and they brought us up very strictly, not talking about these issues. But uh, when I started saying we need to hold the warlords accountable, uh, they would roll their eyes and say, yeah, we were 18 and we wanted to free Palestine. So, you know, oh. calm <laughs> down. And <laughs> eventually I also wanted to free Palestine, but that's, an <laughs> that's another story. In, in any way, I think that, um, yeah, I, I don't know that I would want to think of it as a predicament. I think mm. that the, the 1990s also created a whole barrage of private interests that had a lot to gain from Beirut downtown, from investing in real estate, eventually from the banking sector. And that that class, uh, which completely overlaps with the political class in Lebanon, um, had every vested interest to actually keep things the way they are. And so I think that there's very concrete private interests that can be moved and should be challenged. And here I really think that those of us who have been working over the last uh, decade to create more knowledge and awareness about uh, the political economy that governs the country, who owns the banks, who are the developers, um, how are they interconnected together? What are the relationship to the political class that we actually have gotten to the point where there's much more awareness about this? And that um, today people propose different uh, uh, solutions to the problem, the independence of the judiciary, the reclaiming of the public, the rebuilding of public agencies. So you have proposals on the ground. My fear is with the financial meltdown and the scale it has taken, there's not much uh, space and time to engage people. Uh, so today, I, I mean, I, I do still carry that dream to uh, take, I don't know, the Fuad Butros Highway and actually convince the municipality. And this is true that this is all public and it's public ownership. And it can be an amazing model of creating a shared uh, public space where people can come and meet and discuss that we should reclaim Beirut downtown, refuse that it's solely there. Um, demand that the real estate company returns the spaces to city dwellers so they become parks, so they become, uh, I don't know, digital hubs, places for young Lebanese uh, people to learn new technologies and methods and become be able to generate an intelligent economy that can carry them and give them a future. Those possibilities are there and the know-how is there, but the time is very short. And, and I think this is really my fear that we end up just like in the 1990s saying, look, we're, uh, we're too tired. We can't believe the war ended. I'm really afraid that now people feel this is a luxury, leave us alone. Let us be mm. able to get a small subsidy, a small coupon uh, that can allow us to you know, survive for a few months. It's really interesting dilemma that you have an awareness that's, that's visible today. And it's, it's, sometimes it's on TV. A lot of it is online. People are debating very, very important topics that they weren't before in particular economics it's almost like everyone's become a financial expert in this country <laughs> but everyone has an opinion but it's important it's important to have that debate and an extremely tired population and, and over exhausted for all the right reasons i mean everything that could go wrong went wrong in the past year rather than trying to only focus in do you see that there's now an, an appeal to have both at the same time so that there can be synergy that you could have somebody talking geopolitics and somebody talking on sidewalk repair or potholes or water or electricity that you can do all of the above today and it wouldn't necessarily split the audience it's a tiny country yeah. it's, it's funny yeah. to even think of national and local politics I right, mean, right. Uh, it's it's just you know more than 60% of the Lebanese live in five cities. One third of the Lebanese live in a greater Beirut. Right. Um, it's a tiny country. It cannot exist as, that's why I find it funny when I hear people speaking about cantons, speaking about Switzerland, as if, you know, you have that geography. It's, it's just, you, you're tiny. You can't even survive. You're a city state at best. Uh, <laughs> you need to think about... Uh, 
your relative advantage and think of one program, of course. And then you, you can't do municipal, po municipal politics is not the sidewalk. Municipal politics is the right to housing that has to go through the parliament. Of course, of course yeah. Right? It's, uh, it's uh, the right to... Uh, to uh, to have uh, transfer, uh, an urban urban regulations that are not encouraging speculation. This is the parliament. I mean, what we've done is we've managed basically in the last thirty years. And again, I want to emphasize the local dimension because that's the one that uh, that touches everyone. In the and what I mean by local is the urban actually, and it's really not local. What we've done in the last thirty years is not just sell our historic core and turn it into this big advertisement story that then is going to bring tourists. We've actually made the country a country for sale. We've made land be the main commodity. We have designed property taxation that encourages you to come and buy and do nothing with the land that you have. Every single city around the world, look at Berlin, look at per Paris, look at Vancouver, they've instituted progressive taxes that actually tax you more if you leave your apartment empty. Today in Beirut, if your apartment is empty, you don't pay property taxes, you don't pay municipal taxes. So I'm actually encouraging you to keep the apartment empty. Why? Right. Because somehow we imagine that this is how the only way we can attract money. We're selling the country. We're selling the city. Instead of encouraging people to make a life here, to work here, we're basically telling them find a way to find money from outside. So when you turn the whole story into uh, a story of, uh, of easy real estate transaction and cheap wins and what we call an Arabic safara, right? that's how we look at things, that's what you end up with, uh, a, a completely non-working solution. So I don't think the only problem is a problem of disagreeing on opinions or on political identity. There's a very strong uh, political economy that's built on rapid gain and that benefits a very few who use everything else to keep control over the country. And I think that should be the narrative that brings everyone together to restore our right to live together in a place. I, I apologize. I, I may have asked it in a silly way almost, and it's my fault, mm -hmm. I think. I, I, I'm trying to find a way so that the same person could find appeal on the urban issues. And you're right, of course, it's not about sidewalks. You're right. I mean, I, I, I sorry if I, that sounded, uh, I didn't mean to sort of undersell. Well, the sidewalk sort of, is very important, don't worry. <laughs> even though there's, yeah, I mean, actually, that's maybe the one thing I think about all the time. <laughs> I wish there was a sidewalk here. But I meant in um, that urban issues, the way you're describing them, and broader issues that are polarizing. Is there a, pos is there a way forward so that the same, you could pull in both at the same time, rather than opting in for the more, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying yeah, to- I, I, it, I think I understand what you're saying. What you're yeah. saying is that people have accused Beirut Medina to, to tactically decide to uh, talk only about urban issues because once and, we bring in the other issues, it becomes divided. Sure, and so I didn't forget mean- them. No, no, and I didn't mean, right? I mean, not, nothing accused, um, not accusing Beirut Medina in particular, more than that, if this is if if that is the way forward, or even you know what, let's say something else emerges later that is similar in its sort of attempt to focus in on the core urban landscape only. Is there a way so that no one would be shy to also share broader opinions that are not impacting let's say they don't visibly impact us on a day to day basis, but they're also important so that there's there. Hmm, you could have both in one. Is there any way to you do that in have. this country? I yeah. think so. I mean, mm. I, I, I think so. I think that you you have to to think about what is, I mean, to any any topic that you have to address so that we are a collectivity will require us not to have taboo topics, not to to campaign only on one ground. Oh, I think I, I mean, I fully agree. It's not that we should avoid talking about mm. uh, geopolitics or the fact that a sizable section of the Lebanese community um, has, a, has allegiance or has trust in a foreign power and that it feels that only through the support of this foreign power it can actually protect itself. Um, 
and and stay uh, stay in the country. I mean, I understand these issues, but how do you address them? Right, in the right, last exactly. 20 years, we've yeah. been, uh, I mean, I can say even as a scholar, I work at the American University of Beirut. We have restrictions at AUB from the US government about who can uh, um, attend the lecture that we actually mm. make, mm. who we can invite mm. to come to the lecture. So even our role as uh, as a sp- as, as academics, which is that of uh, creating that space for a conversation, for a collective conversation, right? This is where it starts. If you can't create the conversation, how are you gonna bridge the gaps? When people have such different life stories, we call ourselves Lebanese, right? But we have such different life stories. If you grew up in Arsal and you, um, and you've experienced over the last 10 years, the encroachment of Daesh, uh, uh, the, the influx of refugees, if you have relatives in Syria, your, your, your personal story is very different from someone in Akkad who also has relatives in Syria, but has a very different story, which is again, very different from someone, I don't know, in Beirut or in South Lebanon. The civil war means something to me that's very different right. than someone who grew up, uh, I don't know, in, in, uh, on the borders of Lebanon and Palestine. So definitely you need that at least to start with that conversation. And that conversation has been almost impossible to have because local political parties don't want it to happen because that's a way of deterritorializing the country and losing their power. And also because we have pressures from abroad. So even those young groups that uh, were part of the uh, Beirut uprising, many of them actually have been uh, working in non-governmental organizations that are funded by uh, organizations that restrict who they can invite, who can benefit from the grant. And I'm deliberately pointing to that uh, as a way of saying, it's not just a community that's closed on itself. It's a two-way street in which uh, a rift has been created systematically for the last Uh, 30 years. If I uh, want to bridge that rift, I need to be able to begin with a space for a conversation, a shared platform. And again, that's when you shift from doing opposition to thinking seriously about politics. Politics is about creating that shared platform where people can come and stand together figuratively and practically and say we, right? We, this people. So how are we going to get to that point where we say we the people of, I don't know what, of Lebanon, right? Of, of Beirut, of anything. For us to be able to create that, we need to be able to understand what is it that has created those divides. And I think that part of it is definitely foreign interferences. And I'm giving my example from AUB because I, I feel that uh, I should start with myself. I'm extremely frustrated that I actually have restrictions. Of course, I understand my university, we would go bankrupt in two lawsuits. Uh, so we have to, uh, to, we have to respect that. But at the same time, even AUB, that's the most free, the most inclusive uh, academic environment in the entire region, with no doubt, has restrictions on who can attend lectures in the university, organized by the university. So you start from there and you think about other restrictions and what is happening. And you, you realize that the work has to start somewhere else, outside the institutions, on the street, uh, by creating uh, neighborhood groups, by creating community groups that can actually uh, have the opportunity and the freedom to, to discuss those differences, to understand them and to bridge them. I, I've had a similar conversation with many academics that also have a role in political activism or their sort of civil society, the way we know it in Lebanon, uh, many of them are AUB professors. And it's, it's fascinating that this institution has educated so many students and has offered so many ideas. Uh, and I think anytime this conversation comes up in, in any way, there's some reference or some hint at something said at AUB. So AUB is an important, I think it is still the most important sort of output of information, at least in terms of trying to understand what's happening and sort of charting a way forward. And this, there's this frustration. I, I think it's what you're describing that you can have so many policy papers and so many panel discussions and so many 
even potentially awards and great ideas that come and sort of are celebrated at AUB. You can have ambassadors from different countries cheering on these great ideas too. You can <laughs> even have grant money to promote these ideas and maybe millions of dollars are spent on these ideas. Not just urban planning, of course, I'm talking about across the spectrum. And then when it comes to what's happening, rarely do you see that sort of moving from an academic institution to parliament or, or anywhere in terms of government, municipality, and it sort of dies. Is there any way forward at this point to push through these ideas, at least onto the political scene as we know it right now? So the Definitely. Office, and, and, and beyond, Definitely. yeah, how, how is that, how could that be done? Because it hasn't Look. been done before. Yeah. I think we're actually, I think we're doing it with the with the urban lab and before that, with right. the work we were doing from social justice in the city at the Isam Faris Institute, we've been doing that. We started this idea uh, that said, okay, from now on, we only work on topics that um, have activists already working on them. So we want our research to have echo because we know that if you think that uh, public policy changes in anywhere in the region, because, uh, a politician reads a policy paper, uh, you're very naive. Uh, so uh, you, you want to really uh, realize that for things to change, for success to happen, you need to have uh, research is useful, but it has to have echoes on, on the street, it has to have champions, local champions. And so I started taking research topics, sometimes that I was really, I had to educate myself in, like for find uh, research partners to work with. I mean, look at the plan we did for uh, the city's coast to protect the city's coast, right? So we, we developed a plan. We put on ourselves the restriction that that plan can only exist in as much as it doesn't reduce coefficients of exploitation, which is against my religion, but I wanted to do it to show that a much better a uh, plan can exist within the political constraints that are faced by the municipal council. And um, by basically starting to bring on board to discuss the project, many, many professionals in the city who are working in their private offices and getting them to the point where they would be embarrassed if they don't really discuss that plan or they endorse it because they were part of a conversation. They saw many colleagues actually appreciate it by making the plan available online, easy to access, going to, I went to Amli, I went everywhere and described the, the plan and its ideas. We got to the point where almost everyone I, I, I knew, I would see articles written by young students in a paper that didn't reference our work at all. And that's the best part. It's when you're invited to a protest and you go and you hear people using some of the concepts you've thrown uh, out like a right. couple of, yeah. uh, of years ago. And now everyone is, is saying these ideas and saying uh, private property uh, is not the only mode through which the uh, shared commons need to be addressed, uh, past practice is valuable. So you start seeing this happen and with the coast, with housing, with real estate in Beirut, and now with the post-disaster recovery, I feel that we actually have managed to really um, shift the public conversation so that uh, people begin to have a better sense of what is possible. You, you want people to dream, to aspire to something. And city planning, that's what I meant in that article I, I, I wrote for the Century Foundation. It's that the performative, what I'm calling the performative is that ability to allow people to dream, to demonstrate that something else is possible so that we're not so sitting at home and depressed and feeling this is the best we can get. No, very simply, we can get that. And yeah. that's where the uprising was just fantastic because for a month and a half, Beirut downtown was actually Beirut's historic core. Yeah. It had free psychiatric clinics. It had soup kitchens. It had public political debate. It had art performances. It had music. It had parades. It functioned the way you want a shared collective space to function. And no one can tell you anymore that this is impossible. It was mm. possible. People enacted it. They allowed themselves to perform what they dreamed. And I think that that's where you can find hope. You started the conversation with hope. It's that we have it inside ourselves to, to, to actually collectively enact a different shared us. 
um, and that every time we try, it's going to be a little bit different, but that change doesn't happen in one week. It happens over a long time. And actually there are milestones and I really think the October uprising was one. I share that sentiment fully. And I know, uh, I think these are, these are reflections that may be dismissed too quickly at times, but, and I'm sorry that I'm offering a very, it's almost a cliche example, but breaking in to a lovely building that had been boarded up for decades, the Grand Theater in downtown, seeing something that was stolen and obviously war-torn, but post-war was not brought back, was not given back to the citizens, was just boarded up. To be mm -hmm. able to wander in to something that was frozen in time and have no fear in doing so, knowing that you're not going to be kicked out, at the risk sometimes of losing your life. I mean, there are some risky ledges there that... Yeah. And you have to be very careful. I... The egg was accessible at times in different ways. So I had been inside, but many had not. The younger protesters had never been inside. They were able to hold classes. AUB had classes in the egg, which was astounding. Yeah, some of my colleagues did, yes. yes. There's, there's some magic there. You can't, uh, there's no dismissing that. And I like that you're saying dreaming, that you're offering at least the imagination and knowing that it's in us, we just have to bring it out again. I'm going to go back and wrap it up with the initial phrase which you offered, and I love this phrase, this, this theory of change. You hinted at it in, in different ways. Um, South Africa, the beginning, this post-apartheid reconciliation. Lebanon does not have any reconciliation in its history. Um, you mentioned Berlin and this sort of post-Cold War urban planning. There's, the community is involved. Berliners are involved and they don't need to dream that much. They, they made it happen and it's there. And that's a story on its own. And then there's these other issues. It could be Northern Ireland dealing with paramilitary forces. It could be Bosnia coming out of a civil war, but it's a pacified state. Is it just that for us to get to that change, we have to go back to what we didn't do in 1989, 1990? that three decades later, 31 years later, we still have to address what tore this country apart? I mean, I, 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 don't, I honestly don't think there's one solution. Mm. I, I don't think you can say we can just go back to 1989. And, and I also don't want to think that we can do it all and pretend like we don't exist in a region that is so devastated. I mean, we're yeah. all watching right now. Our eyes are riveted on Jerusalem, but... Yeah. Jerusalem is just a single incident of uh, how many decades and decades of dispossession and uh, systematic erasure of uh, people's histories. So we are in a region that has to uh, reinvent itself also at the regional level. And we have to invent a, a, a way of engaging um, the region that is very different from uh, where we are now. So I can't say that by just uh, holding the war criminals uh, accountable, we uh, we will uh, we will solve our problems. We we will be able to sort of turn a page. But I do think that uh, uh, war criminals are war criminals, and if they're not held accountable, they shouldn't be celebrated as national heroes or imagined for one minute as statesmen or stateswomen, they're war criminals. And so I do think that this is a necessary part of, uh, of our national healing. I don't know what form that tribunal can take 30, 40 years after the end of the civil war or right. the end of the violence, but it has to take a form. Um, they're not only uh, still operating in impunity, they're still taking themselves seriously and promising us accountability for those who took the country to bankruptcy as if they had nothing to do with it. Um, that makes me sick. So yes, accountability is definitely in our culture, generally is very important. And I, I would certainly think it's a beginning, but it's not, it's a necessary, but not a sufficient ingredient. This is why I wanted to talk to you. And I really, <laughs> no, I, I, I appreciate that nuanced, it's, it's almost a nuanced optimism while also addressing that this is a very critical time. And I, I, I'm really fortunate to be able to gauge your mind once again. And um, 
for anyone listening rather than watching that article, the Century Foundation, it's embedded. Um, I'm, AB is very lucky to have you, Mona. Uh, I'm lucky to consider you potentially a friend from over a decade ago and now a guest on the podcast. So this is a, it was a thrill for me. And I, I really appreciate your, your wider view. And I think it's necessary. I think at times focusing in on just what's happening now, it, it, it removes, it, it derails earlier attempts and you've lived through them. I think you've lived through all of them since the civil war ended. You've taken part in different ways as well. So I really appreciate your, your words today. So thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you for having me. And uh, I feel lucky to be on your podcast and also at AUB, I have to say in this moment. So thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed our conversation. And in 259 more episodes, you'll be back <laughs> no, but earlier than that. that. I look forward to that. <laughs> Before that happens, don't worry. Hopefully, I'll, I'll, I'll... <laughs> Hopefully I won't be uh, completely seen out by then. We'll see. Oh, I mean, I think by then both of us would have lost our minds completely. We'll be reflecting. Oh, there we go. Finally, That's... the special guest. <laughs> and she turned on my, the music on my computer. That's Sorry. Great. <laughs> that's a lovely way to wrap it up <laughs> sorry no, don't I'm be. trying to find the uh... <laughs> now you know my secret when I write that's what I listen to well I would have been scared if you listened to you know like hardcore electronic music I I, I assume that's it's my classical son. Okay. that's my son yeah no, I, with me it's usually jazz and uh, maybe you too I love you too that's how, how recent it will get Exactly. Thanks, Roni. <laughs> thank you, you have Mama. a lovely evening. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you to the cat. Thanks for listening and watching. And a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. <laughs>